Let's get this party started inside the mediation room. here with us inside the mediation room. Um, you know, I, there are two things that I love. There are two things that I love a lot. I love the idea of rising. I love the idea of rising, right? Rising for me, I think about, you know, it's so inspirational when I think about this idea of rising. Um, it's, it's inspirational. It, it, it makes me feel um, just empowered and, and 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 like 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 uh, like anyone like we can do anything, and then I also love this idea of stars. I love the stars, Karen. You know I love looking up at the stars. So much possibility. When we and can so, see them, yeah. Right when we can see them, I can just stare up there and 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 stare at those stars for hours. Um, and today we have a rising star, so that's mm -hmm. why I know. I know we're gonna love this episode. Laura Traum is a partner at the Reutberg Traum Law and Mediation, uh, located in Forest Hills, uh, New York. Shalom to anyone listening in Forest Hills. Yes, represent. Uh, she practices family law in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, also known as the tri-state area, I believe. Um, and she uh, practices family mediation nationally and internationally. She she does it not only in English. She does mediation in Russian too. All right, two for one with Laura Traum. She graduated from the Great Cardoza School of Law at Yeshiva University, where now she teaches as a lecturer on conflict resolution and mediation. How cool is that to teach where you graduated from? Awesome, amazing, doesn't get better than that. Her new book, Effectively Representing Clients in Family Mediation is co-authored by mediation legend, Forrest Woody Mostyn and Elizabeth Potter Scully. It's available for pre-order, not even off the presses. It's so hot, it's not even off the presses yet. It's available for pre-order at the American Bar Association's website. Laura, you're here. We're so happy to have you. Congratulations. There's so much to talk about. Oh my goodness. But Karen, I mean, where do we begin? Is there a place we can start here? We always need to start with the most important question of the hour. Think back, Laura, when you were a child and you'd wake up in the morning and You'd be so hungry, you didn't know what to do with yourself. And you'd go into your pantry. What cereal? What's your favorite childhood cereal that comes to mind? That is a really good question with a um, an indirect answer because... I did not grow up in an American cultural environment. I'm a first generation American. Uh, so my household foods tended in the kind of Russian, Jewish, post-Soviet direction. So you could have a breakfast of, I mean, my favorite would be a cup of black tea with a substantial amount of honey and lemon. Um, and a piece of toast, potentially with some caviar on it. Now, not the bougie, ritzy version of caviar that we're used to, but the down-the-street Russian grocery uh, bulk purchase of red caviar that we would smear on toast on our way out the door. Street caviar. I, street, I, caviar. street caviar. <laughs> Laura, I, like I called that. I, I let Michael know it's not cereal today. 
<laughs> no. Not cereal today. Yeah. No, no lucky charms in the Trom house. No. No lucky Just charms. Caviar how instead of the how lucky about, charms. How about today? Any cereal today? Today. Oh, so we're trying to see whether assimilation occurred. Um, well, today did shift to a bagel. So there's some deep New York happening. <laughs> I, mean, I hear it's the water. That's what makes yeah. this bagel so great. Yeah. Taryn, if you live in Forest Hills, you must have bagels. It's actually a law in Forest Hills. You have <laughs> to have bagels not. for breakfast. Um, Thanks for playing, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we can't take one more minute without beginning a discussion of this book. Um, I was so lucky to get an advanced copy of the book, and I have read the book. Uh, I absolutely love this book. Um, I, I, I can't say enough good things about it uh, and how um, potentially just, just completely... Um, family law practice shifting it can be because you know we have family mediators and we have uh, family law attorneys it's this two lane highway right to to divorce and, and custody issues but your book is saying wait a second there's another lane right you have the attorney at law lane and, and the family mediator lane but this is a new lane you're making the argument and, and the case so beautifully there's this attorney in mediation lane, right? Wait, what, what? Attorney in mediation. Basically, one of the big premises here is that a family law attorney could, if they made the act of choice, build an entire practice around representing clients in mediation, not just a side hustle, side gig every once in a while. You're saying attorneys can actually have their advocacy work and eat it too, right? They can have they can have it both ways. They can represent clients, they can advocate for their, their peeps, but they can do it in the mediation room all day, every day, and become known in their communities as the go-to attorney to represent clients in mediation, really shepherding all of their clients in to mediation. And interestingly, for a family law attorney to make that shift, what you're saying is it begins with actually the attorney who's interested in this, shifting their mindset. So true or false, this is where we wanna start. Laura, true or false, if all family law attorneys in America read your book, the family law system would essentially 180 degrees pivot and morph into the dream of what family law could be in America. True or false? Is that about right? I would say it's a true aspiration. <laughs> um, it's true as a, as a benchmark goal, uh, perhaps. Uh, I wonder whether it would need to be core curriculum uh, in law schools for that to occur as opposed to existing family lawyers reforming. But I think that if everyone read it, uh, their preconceived notions about family practice uh, would be challenged um, and there might be an opportunity to think differently. Yeah, yeah. So it's got to start in the law schools, you're saying. But in the meantime, how do we get every attorney in America to read this book, right? Because if they knew that they could build it, I got to believe they would come. Can you tell us more about the shift in the family attorney's mindset, right? To make this successful transition from their practice that they're used to, litigation, um, every once in a while representing a client in mediation. Tell us about key key ways that the attorney is going to need to shift their mindset to be successful in, in, in making this transition? Well, if you are used to um, a family law or a divorce representation practice where your goal is to maximize um, your client's 
you know, benefits at the end of the negotiation, right? The goal is to maximize the assets they're walking away with, maximize the parenting time if that's what they want or minimize it if they don't want it. Um, if that is your role as an attorney representing, um, it works in court. It works when you're in this adversarial system where you're igniting warfare, uh, where you need to holler the position off the rooftops for the judge to hear those five minutes and, and for something to land, right? Yeah. But if you're in a mediation room, the skill set is different and the goal might be different because it's constructive restructuring of a family, right? So you had a family that looked a certain way and now it's going to look some other way uh, with households shifting, with logistics for kids shifting, with the finances being recalibrated and split up in some way, with debts potentially being consolidated, whatever it is that's happening, um, it's happening off of a whole and for an attorney in rep representing in that setting uh, to maintain a position that is for one piece of the whole, for one party to the whole, um, is not as effective in an environment where you're sitting wow. at a table together. Wow. So the mindset shift is not just, I mean, collaborative is a buzzword that may lose meaning with time, but not just to be someone open to collaboration with all of the counterparts at the table, but open to letting it go when the position is not worthwhile and brainstorming creatively when the law might not actually cover everything this particular family needs but creative brainstorming might. So I think the mindset shift for family law practitioners who've exclusively done representation in court is to understand that they are not the gatekeepers for all of the options that exist and to have some of that humility uh, where they can meet this family as one unit and help the family together with other professionals transition into multiple units, however that might look, without these preconceived notions of three options or five options that boilerplate fit um, and letting go of that. Wow. Okay. There is a lot to unpack there. Um, just a lot to unpack. So you're describing this get as much as you can mindset, this zealous advocacy mindset, right? Where the focus is on getting as much as you can, best possible deal for your clients. And what you're saying is, all right, you know, maybe let it go, some of that stuff, some positions that, you know, aren't serving the kids, maybe some positions that aren't, um, uh, maybe necessarily going to help the greater good of finding resolution on the more important issues. You know, let it go, let it go. I know you sing, Laura. <laughs> one of these days, do a little mediator duet. Oh, I, yes. I Google, Google Laura on the YouTube, or you'd YouTube her. You wouldn't Google her on the YouTube. Well, I guess you could. You could Google YouTube Laura Traum. And, and hear what a pretty voice Laura has. What you're saying is let some of that stuff go. And actually, this, this is somewhat scandalous. All right, I want to draw attention to the scandalous nature of what you're saying. Rather than this unconditional duty to the client advocating for the client, you're saying attorneys in mediation can shift the mindset and really expand their advocacy to what is best for the family as a whole. Yes, you're advocating for your client, but you're expanding that pie to mm -hmm. also include helping coach your client expand their perspective. What is best actually for the family? 
What is going to provide stability for both parents financially? What is going to provide stability and what is going to serve the emotional and psychological development of the children's well-being? Yes? Yes, you know, I would say it's not a rejection of advocacy, right? I would just say that um, it's recalibrating from the concept of zealous advocacy to the concept of intelligent advocacy, right? And that's different because zealous advocacy could be, I will do anything and everything and undercut everyone and holler to get what I think is maximum, but that's not always best, right? And intelligent advocacy um, requires some breath, some pause uh, for the attorney to take a moment and table themselves and think and think about the holistic picture and then advocate for their client intelligently in the context of that picture and not on any sort of autopilot. Got it. Wow. All right. Words of wisdom there. Oh, great. So I'm so curious, Laura, you graduated from Cardoza Law School at Yeshiva University. And then what? Can you take us on your path from- Sure. So you became a mediator. So I actually trained in mediation before law school. It's a very odd inversion. It's not what people typically do. So um, I, before becoming an attorney, was a musician, as, as you mentioned. Um, and I worked in the Jewish music world. And I was a choral conductor and singer. And loved that work and, you know, cherished those colleagues, but always had this pull towards um, like family dramas. Even when I was like teaching teenagers, I would get a little too, music, I would get a little too involved in what was going on in other aspects of their lives. Um, and I myself am a child of divorce. Um, my firm, Reutberg Traum, we're a mother-daughter firm. Uh, so I had a lot of modeling all around, but it wasn't the path that I was walking until I realized I just couldn't quiet that innate draw, right? So I was in other spheres and in other industries and still had that, that internal something that was pulling me towards that walk of life. So while I was still working in the music realm, um, I did a 40 hour basic training uh, in family and divorce mediation in New York uh, with NYCID. And I would say that was, you know, dipping the toes in. But when I started law school, and one of the reasons I chose Cardozo was because it has, you know, its dispute resolution program, the QCAN program, which is known for that. And there was a pathway that was mediation forward uh, through law school uh, that I could undertake from day one. So it wasn't after law school that the mediation ethos attached. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of, it was premeditated. <laughs> wow, what a journey. You and Michael have a lot in common with your, your musical backgrounds and now you're both mediators. Do yep. you ever use your beautiful chops in the meeting <laughs> room to dissolve conflict? I mean, you could just stand up as a strategy, sing, and I imagine that would calm the room down. You know, I have been, or er, I have had urges in moments of high conflict um, when people are talking over each other in a mediated set setting to to you know, hit a high C and see what happens. Um, but I've refrained. <laughs> um, I think part of the music background that is helpful is not the melodic component, but when you are trained to think about your audience, to think about the characters, to um, 
not to perform theatrically, but to table your day and what you have going on and who you are and and be there for something else, um, it translates to the mediation room because you can be there for the family at hand. Absolutely. And you're also using your listening skill as you're listening to the music. You probably are very attuned. That's right. Listening in the room. And I imagine many mediators who have different backgrounds use something from their background to enhance their, their skills as mediators. That's right. Now, That's don't right. discount breaking out in the song, though, Laura. Don't discount it. I have been <laughs> have known you done it? on occasion to break out into Aretha Franklin's R E S P E C T. You mm -hmm. will. Whoa. All right. And you know what? They can't help but laugh. And 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 the respect. It just may. It might um, rise from there. And so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, your background. I mean, you 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 do the you do the opera thing. Um, more classical background. I'm not sure well, if the Jewish the music jazz, the jazz, the jazz is in there. But the I'm jazz, curious. Yeah. Do you have um, a list of neutral songs to break into? You know, as opposed to positional songs, which many might be. <laughs> I mean, the sun will come out tomorrow. The sun will come out. <laughs> Yes, in the heat of conflict, the sun will come out. <laughs> I mean, really, that that actually leads us right in to another topic, right? Getting back to mindset, getting back to mindset, the book, this reminds me now, the book um, goes in a little bit to uh, mediator, uh, goes into this idea um, of mediator mindset, um, talking about the mediator as a beacon of hope um, mm -hmm. and, and noting at one, one point, uh, and I'm going to quote from the book, uh, one of the mediator's greatest attributes is to be the one person in the room who has an optimistic demeanor and belief that regardless of the conflict, progress toward agreement, if not a written settlement is possible, mm -hmm. right? The mediator does not need to be so lonely uh, as a lawyer for one of the spouses, you too can be a second beacon of hope. When the other spouse or lawyer makes an outrageous offer, try to find the nugget of movement uh, upon which to build. Um, if your offer is rejected, um, shrug it off and come up with another proposal with a better chance of acceptance. Your rose-colored vision and grounded behavior will not only model positive negotiation behavior for your client, but also get you the respect of the other side and appreciation from the mediator. Hello, hello, Pollyanna. You agree, right? I've been called Pollyanna, Karen too. <laughs> oh goodness, we just believe that there's always an answer and believe that it's so important to authentically bring that belief system into the room. So you're saying, look, it's not just for mediators, it's also for attorneys. We got to believe that the sun will come out tomorrow, maybe even sometime in the session itself. So great segue. Do you want to talk a little more, Laura, about that concept and how how is it that you bring that optimism, that belief into the mediation room? So, you know, to to undertake kind of the attorney in mediation identity, and that that shift that needs to happen, you know, when you're representing uh, a client, it's very easy to get dragged into their way of thinking about the issues, right? So you are um, advocating for them, and when something happens, uh, the finances are being blocked in a certain way, or uh, there's a tragic veto of an extracurricular activity or something that happens during the process, um, the attorney can get stuck in, this is horrible. These, these parties are never going to be able to co-parent effectively. Um, we have to go to court and the house needs to be partitioned and you know, wh whatever it is. Um, but if the attorneys and if both attorneys in the mediation room don't do that, right? And yeah. say, 
we've been party to hundreds or thousands of cases. We've seen the worst of it. And we know that at the end of the day, restructuring happens. You know, co-parenting happens, might look different ways in different scenarios, but it happens. Um, bankruptcy does not always happen, right? Um, there, there can be some perspective that the, the attorney can continue to hold. Yeah. And at times, you know, a mediator, especially a mediator who sometimes has sessions with just counsel, um, can remind the attorneys to hold that for their clients. Because their clients, you know, for many people, it's their, not for all, but for many people, it's their first divorce, right? They've never gone through this. Their family is, is shaking at its core. And they are entitled to feel that this is the end of the world and that yeah. there is light at the end of the tunnel. Like that's their human experience. They're entitled to feel that way. The professionals are the ones to shine the light. They're yeah. the ones to not drown in that moment, uh, but to guide. Yeah. And the mediator does that. And the attorneys that are part of a mediated process can also do that and really succeed when they do. Yeah. Uh, Laura, that, that's beautiful. That guides me into my next question for you, along with this, this theme of positivity and being a light and guiding our clients. What personal attributes or qualities do you feel make you an effective professional mediator? Maybe something that you believe you have within yourself, something that others can embody as well. So one attribute that, you know, people tell me I have, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's consistent, but I really don't tend to prejudge anything. You know, there's this, I'm pretty accepting of whatever life throws your way, whatever people cross your path and that general acceptance without judgment of what you are living alongside of, experiencing or journeying with, um, I think is the trait that helps me most in mediation. You know, walking into a room, seeing a family and being able to say, I don't know you yet. And, mm -hmm. um, and you are who you are in this process. And I'm not trying to change that. I'm accepting that that's, what it is and we're working with that um and i do that in my own life and i didn't always but but i do in my own life and i i think it really translates to the work in a helpful way mm, that's a skill yeah. what you're talking about here is open mindedness curiosity mm -hmm. mindfulness and what you're saying is you can develop this skill yeah. By each time walking into a room with a new set of clients saying, I don't know where you've been. I don't know your story. And every time we find ourselves judging, which I think is very human, yeah. and we all do it, it's evolutionary. We can catch ourselves and be mindful and take a step back. Right. Karen, we are certainly works in progress, aren't we, Karen? Just, uh, just awareness right that moment-to-moment -moment awareness um that is the first step right laura it's that coming into consciousness of of the moment and am i accepting the moment at this moment or am i reacting uh to the moment and goodness it is it's work it's work to recondition ourselves but isn't that the source work for the family mediator, isn't it really, doesn't it really begin there? Going back to that discussion uh, about the optimism piece for the attorney, it's the same discussion, right? It's it's this idea that attorneys uh, in, in, in large larger numbers than we'd like to see, which is why your book is so important, right? Because we're trying to shift things. They yeah. may believe that in order to develop rapport or solidify the trust of their client, that that reactivity, like, oh my goodness, that 
proposal is not, it's preposterous. It's, it's mm. offensive, right? They're aligning with their clients in that way when actually rather than react, if there was acceptance and modeling for the client of, okay, that's where they are now. Look and normalize it for them. You know, I've seen this before, been in plenty of these mediations where there's a proposal like that, but now let's, let's look to a solution, our next step, right? We're trading instead of piggy banking on the client's fears, right? And, and, and adding fuel to the fear fire. It's a lot of F's there. Instead, what we're doing is we're shifting from that, that fear mindset to faith mindset, instilling faith in our clients. And actually that will create more trust with them. When they see their attorney as someone who's bringing faith to the process, that's going to be more helpful to the client. That's going to build more trust in the client. That That's going to be far more productive. Um, they're going to be liked and appreciated as an attorney. Uh, and it starts with the awareness in the moment. Um, what, you know, Karen is pointing to. Whoa, there's a lot there, isn't there? There's a lot. And, you know, I would say that that internal work and the skill of the professional, whether it's the mediator or the attorneys in mediation, um, I think that work actually gets harder the longer you practice, right? So as opposed to other skills that are become rote, you know, your knowledge of the law with minor, you know, annual updates or other things that smooth out. Um, I think this work gets harder as you go along to remind yourself to not walk in and say, oh, it's this kind of a case or it's that kind of a case or, and to automatically characterize because you've seen a thousand. I think the more, the more you see, the harder it is to remind yourself. Um, I don't know them yet. Uh, and I will, and they too have a solution, and there might even be new approaches, even though this is case, you know, 2002. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Look, I actually, I love how you frame that, Laura, and, and I think it's so true. The, 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 the deeper we go into this as mediators, I can speak for myself, in many ways, the more challenging it becomes. It's easy. Ignorance is easy, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure I could found a different word for that, but but it's true. Being in the dark, not realizing, right? Being in a place as a mediator or as an attorney where you haven't yet realized that every single choice you make has an effect on the outcome, right? And, and just making choices without being conscious of those choices and how they're actually affecting the mediation, how they're affecting the substance of agreements, how they're affecting the future for this entire family. You know, it's just kind of a place where you can be. And then once you realize, wow, whether I react here from a place of force and fear or whether I accept here and maneuver this and swing it to a place of encouragement and hope and, and moving on to solutions. Now that you realize that, it's like, oh, wow, I have a responsibility every moment to be aware of my choices and make the best possible choice I can. And then you have, I mean, I could describe it as the weight of that, but I actually think it's quite freeing, right? It's amazing to realize the choice that you have in every moment, but it does get more challenging once you realize that. It uh, does. It does. Amazing. That's yeah. why I'm, I'm always in awe. You know, I, um, when, when I went to uh, Woody Mostyn's training, it was before it was Mostyn Guthrie um, and, you know, really bonded with Woody there and got to know him very well. I came in as his assistant trainer, um, watching when he shows, leads by example, and he has this moment in his training where he has his trainees try to stump the master right um and they bring all kinds of situations and twists to the narrative and all of that and and it's it's a challenge to the master mediator like how would he handle it and he, 
it's not just what everyone learns from watching that in a fishbowl type of way, but the fact that he himself exposes himself in that way, becomes vulnerable as a practitioner to being thrown, to being presented with something new and different and having to navigate it live in front of, you know, students. Um, it's really a model for what all of us as professionals should continue to do, like not get too comfortable uh, and and be in that space of uncertainty because that reminds us to hold a little humility and know that every human being is different and we do not know the answers, but we can facilitate. Wow, that's great. We do need that flexibility, that open-mindedness. Yeah. Well, we also need structure. Yes, so true. Let's get to our next question, Lara. Let's break it down. Break it down now. Break it down now. <laughs> what percentage of your mediations are in-person versus online? So I am now entirely online. Um, I do not meet with any anyone in person. We started our virtual work before COVID. So we had a we had a hybrid practice before COVID with some Zoom. So the transition was really smooth when the pandemic hit because we were already doing it. Um and clients prefer it. You know, in in our experience in, in my firm, um the convenience of not commuting, the experience of um, being able to be in different places or even on a shared screen, you know, that varies for people logging in from work, logging in from your car, um, finding that private space, sometimes not being in the same room at a table, sometimes being in your living room on screen at a table. Um, and those little boxes, right, that we even have right now on this you know, on this Zoom uh, that show who's talking and who's not talking for a moment and the mm -hmm. organic uh, referee of the tech system, <laughs> um, taking a little bit of that police work away from the mediator and allowing the mediator to otherwise listen. Um, it's just such a boon to practice on so many levels. Yes, yeah. Colin Rule. I know Colin is listening. I know because Colin tunes in. And he um, says and rules. Like, I'm, I'm fangirling, just right, just thinking about Colin Rule being here. What was that, Karen? I said, and he's saying this question rules. Oh, he's saying this question <laughs> rules. All right. Yeah, he hasn't. He sure is. But he's like, he's giggling like a little schoolboy right now because here's yet another um, rising star mediator. Star. I mean, really, just a star, Laura. Uh, who has gone a hundred percent and mm -hmm. is citing over yeah. and over again what so many great mediators are saying that it's just, just advantageous. By the way, Colin Rule, godfather of ODR, ODR masterclass at mediate.com. Little plug. You can register, Colin, huh? Huh? Uh, great I don't want to miss that one. I mean, goodness gracious, Laura. Now you now you better be there. That's um, a good plug. <laughs> Laura, how many mediation sessions do you typically have? What's the length? There are many mediators who watch this, who are developing their practice, developing their standards. And so if you can answer the length, what a typical case looks like for you. So my mediation structure is... Um, in the beginning, it's a little bit variable because we start with a one hour joint orientation. Mm -hmm. Then we break out into individual hours and then it's joint session work for the remainder of our time together. The joint sessions are two hour blocks of time in my practice, but that pre-work in the orientation and individual hours, um, sometimes enables us to be done after that one joint working session for okay. you know for some cases it's three or four of those joint working sessions but it's usually in that 
ballpark. Of course, there might be time in between, um, especially when there are complicated assets uh, where they're gathering information or we're scheduling a session and bringing in a financial pro or things like that come up that are unique for every case. Uh, but it's usually in that trajectory. Okay. And how long do your individual sessions typically last for prior to meeting with them joint again? Um, just one hour each. One hour each. Okay. And do you ever find yourself when you're in joint session again, caucusing, putting somebody in a waiting room, which is what we would do on, on Zoom, yeah. being able to have those, those individual meetings if need be? So before I incorporated those preliminary hours into my practice, I found that caucusing came up more um, in those joint working sessions, that there might be heated moments, walkaway moments that called for it, and I would send them to breakout rooms um, that I would float between. But with those preliminary one-on-one -on -one sessions, it's such an opportunity to release and unload and also share, you know, my priority interests are X and someone else might have different ones that um, it enables me when I'm mediating to hold that information and guide accordingly. And I don't tend to step in it as much <laughs> as, as I did before I had that structure. Um, okay. So the caucusing doesn't come up as much. Interesting. Very interesting. You find those individual meetings helpful? Yeah, they're helpful in how I structure topics um, because I can structure them in a more informed way. Wow, that's great. And what are your policies in regards to communicating separately between meetings? Ah. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no offline communication. Anything is you know, joint email, copying the other. Um, I actually prefer that it be joint email only and not group texts because sometimes the group texts have, you know, depending on if you have your iPhone or your Android, they get read differently. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit of a variable. So emails, copying everyone involved, and that's the only way. Okay, great. And, and a question about your fee structure. Do you typically do an hourly? Do you have a retainer, a flat fee? How do you typically work with your clients? So I have a retainer, a small retainer that's held for incidentals. Mm -hmm. That's not actually um, applied to anything unless it's some sort of, you know, case where where the attorneys in the mediation if there are attorneys go rogue that's when that starts to hit um but typically that's not touched and it's returned at the end the mediation sessions are hourly and then drafting is flat fee okay. so kind of a little bit of all of it yeah wonderful thank you for answering that and final question of our break it down questions. Oh, break it down now. What do you think, Laura, helps you and your mom stand out besides you working with your mom, which is incredible. I love that family practice. Mm -hmm. What makes your mediation firm stand out? What do you think is different about the way that you approach mediation or your clients? So, you know, one aspect that in, in one way in which we stand out is we are not prescriptive, right? So we have our honed approach. We understand what we're doing as professionals and it's very deliberate. But when families call us and they're you know, shopping around for, for mediators, um, they consistently feel heard for who they are. And where we are situated um, in Queens, and you know we practice all over, but because our practice emanated from Queens, um, there's a lot of cultural sensitivity that we have just from the experience of having dealt with every possible ethnicity and religion that you can think of, 
uh, where we're in the borough with the most languages and the most, you know, most varied demographics uh, in the country. So that in, that is part of why people turn to us because we have experience with, you know, the intergenerational impact of mediating with uh, families of Chinese or South Asian, you know, backgrounds, mediating in the shadow of New York law and Sharia law, or in the shadow of New York law and halaha, like for different communities, um, they understand that, that that's our sweet spot. And families turn to us because their lives are not exclusively built in the shadow of New York law. Um, and we can hold those uh, cultural, uh, that cultural umbrella simultaneously and those different legal structures that uh, cultures can offer um, wow. Wow. as we mediate. So that, so people turn to us for that. I mean, you have such a calm nature about you. Your essence is very calming. I imagine when your clients call you that they feel that, they sense that, and I would go see you. <laughs> is there something you're not telling me, Karen? <laughs> <gasps> what? I thought we were getting along well. If I ever go to Queens, I don't know, how's the pizza in Queens? Oh, I thought, I mean, divorce mediator, you want, you would go see her as a divorce mediator. Only if there's a good pizza shop next door. Oh, good pizza. Well, there's, come on, as far as Hills, it's not only good New York pizza, it's good New York kosher pizza. It doesn't wow. get any better than that. Come there's on. good pizza, but you know, the hope is that the two of you yeah. never turn to me, but if no. you do, I would say that you have a common candle between your two, uh, you know, Zoom boxes, but yeah. some differences in the, you know, level of plant life. So there'd be something to work on. <laughs> yes. uh, so you're saying I need some more growth. <laughs> you're saying, Lara. Okay. That's true. That's Michael, true. did you give me all your tchotchkes? Oh, uh, man. I mean, you're tchotchke heavy there. over there. You're tchotchke heavy. For those of you who are listening to the podcast uh, without <laughs> the video, uh, Karen is the tchotchke queen today. Uh, we've got all kinds of goodness happening over there on the Hollywood Square. Um, you know, gosh, we, we only have a few minutes left. Um, quick, question from, quick question from John, who who said in the chat, can you restate the Masterclass plug, the website address? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. And John, uh, we have a, a, a live yeah. audience. By the way, if you're listening, we do this live because what other way is there to do it? Um, so live audience question is, can you restate the plug for Colin Rule's masterclass? I can. Here's what I figured out, though, right after I made the plug. Um, the registration has closed. Uh, look, the this is what happens when you have someone like Colin Rule, who is giving a masterclass in ODR, um, and he basically invented uh, ODR. Uh, is it, it it's it's open for a minute and then it closes. So here's what I would do, John. Uh, I would email admin at mediate.com. Let them know you listened uh, to Inside the Mediation Room uh, and you'd love to find a way into that class. I'm not sure what they can do. Uh, mediate is very accommodating, uh, but if, if it's completely full, uh, they may not be able to accommodate it, but you can ask, uh, go ahead and ask. Um, and Colin says, there. we're going to do another one over the summer. Perfect. Another one. All right. It, it's, it, this thing probably sold out in the first day that they released it. And so they'll release it again. I'm so glad to hear Colin's already going to do it again. Um, there you go. Yes. There you go, John. Um, sweet. So Michael, you are you're bordering on a Taylor Swift scandal here with your <laughs> clothes ticketing. <laughs> Just Taylor Swift because someone is obsessed with the new album. And by someone, I mean both Karen and I. <laughs> Meet me at midnight. Okay. Um, it's really good. Um, you know, I, I wasn't even a fan of Taylor Swift and and I like that album. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey, it I, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me, Taylor says. Uh, anti-hero. The single on the album, plugging Taylor Swift and Colin Rule, right side. I mean, they just seem to go together. Definitely. Well. It's both um, fun. <laughs> I, I know we have to get to these um, last 10 questions. Are we there? Are oh, we there? Right. Do, I, do I have just one minute? Do I have one more minute to ask a quickie? 
here, Karen? What do you think? Go for it. I just am so curious. We've talked a lot about now the cultural aspects of your mediation practice, and this is a huge topic in the mediation world. One of my heroes and and uh, teachers, Nina Meyerding, really is um, you know such a uh, a beacon of of information and teaching here on on cross cultural competence. And so you you're in an area where there is a, a cultural and religious uh, mm-hmm. community. I'm wondering before we get to this these last ten questions, um, the inside the actor studio questions. I'm so excited for them. James Lipton made them famous. They're coming in a second. How has your faith impacted your practice? Can you be brief about this, Laura, to explain how your own faith has impacted um, how you approach inside the mediation room? Um, To be brief, um, I would say that having faith gives you the reference point for what impact faith can have on one's life and on how one builds family. So when interacting with others of any other faith or, you know, being religiously political or whatever else is the faith structure informing that person's life um, really affects how you mediate because it can be a core pillar in that family's, you know, growth and restructuring plan. Gotta have faith. (laughs) Oh my gosh, it's so true. Um, love that answer. Okay. We're moving on. We're, I'm so sad that we're at the end of the episode. I could sit here and talk to you for another hour, Laura. Uh, I could, um, but we're wrapping this up, uh, with the 10 questions made famous on inside the actor's studio, originally, originally asked by talk show host, Bernard Pivot, uh, the French talk show host and made famous by James Lipton. Question number one. What is your favorite word? Um, acceptance, definitely. Wow. What is your least favorite word? My least favorite word is impressive when it's used to describe a person. I don't know what that means. Yeah. I, I believe we're all impressive. Exactly. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Especially Michael. Michael's impressive. Michael's impressive, right, Michael? Oh, okay, all right, all right. No divorce meeting. Wildly. <laughs> no divorce. We're safe for now. Um, <laughs> what turns you on? Um, that feeling when you're with people um, that you don't have to pick your words with, uh, where there, you could be light or somber or goofy, mm-hmm. uh, and you don't have to act as anything, um, that feeling. That feeling of genuine authenticity. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing better. What turns you off? Um, Words over actions, like unfulfilled promises or big talk and minimal action. Wow. What sound or noise do you love? Um, I love crackles, like the crackle of a candle or the crackle of a vinyl record, that kind of crackle. Ooh, well, back to cereal, if you haven't had it, right? <laughs> Christmas treats, they crackle when you pour them. Ah, uh, yes, tuning in. <laughs> Snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> and what sound or noise do you hate? Oh, for sure, chewing a banana. I cannot. My skin crawls. Wow, I've never heard that before. And oh my I, gosh. yeah, my daughters have bananas today. So next time, maybe tomorrow, hold my ear really close and I will think of you. <laughs> An attitude. It's, it's on my list too. Um, <laughs> what? Oh boy. All right. Um, brace yourself for this one. Don't necessarily need to say it, but you could intimate potentially. What is your favorite curse word? Hmm. Well, I guess there's one that everyone uses, but I would say my favorite derogatory term um, is calling someone a doorknob. Doorknob. 
Mm-hmm. Such a doorknob. Such yeah. a doorknob. <laughs> love, it. love it. Love it. What profession other than your own and obviously your musical background would you like to attempt? Hmm. Retirement? Is that a profession? Oh, um, yeah. I wonder if at some point in the distant future, that's something that I'll get to attempt. Okay. I'm rooting for you. What <laughs> profession would you not like to do? Probably wouldn't want to be a CPA, especially right now. It's like on the mind with tax season and I don't know how they do it. So no CPA for me. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. Well, coming off of this book, I would say I would want God to tell me that I'm forgiven for any typos. <laughs> Spoken like the editor in chief of a Cardoza <laughs> Law Review. I know you did that too, Laura, and we are so <laughs> grateful to have had you today inside the mediation room. Thanks for having me. Wow. You're awesome, Laura.